Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Luis da Silva. I'm the executive director of CCI. And for those of you who are not yet familiar with CCI, we're the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative. We're an initiative of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, and our mission is research, innovation, and workforce development at the intersection between cybersecurity, autonomous systems, and data um, slash artificial intelligence. And every semester we run a seminar series. Um, and this is the first um, talk in the spring semester uh, seminar series. Uh, and the theme for this spring is going to be the human side of cybersecurity. So we're very honored to have Dr. David Woods with us today. Uh, and the organizer of this seminar series for the spring is Dr. Milos Manish from um, Virginia Commonwealth um, University. So I'll pass the baton to Milos and let uh, him introduce David. Milos, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much, Louise, for entrusting me with this role. Uh, David Woods is a, a fantastic speaker, an awesome choice to, to kick this series with. Um, I will not do justice trying to describe Dave's work, but I did put uh, one slide to, um, um, to try to illustrate the, the tremendous, exciting body of work he's done and positions he's, he's held. Um, he's a professor of cognitive system engineering and human system interaction at Ohio State University. He's a founder a, and a past um, president of Resilience Engineering Association, past president of Human Factors and Ergonomics, uh, one of the all the societies uh, founded in 1957. Um, he studied SNAFU Catchers Consortium on Industry and University Partnership to build resilience in critical digital services, very highly cited. Uh, H index 92, over 35,000 citations, uh, author, author or editor of eight books. Um, I've known Dave for, for, for many years. Uh, I, was, I was looking through my hard drive to, to find some of the, the old things that, that uh, I, I, uh, I was present when Dave was, was talking. And one was the um, National Workshop on Resilience uh, funded by NSF that we organized way back in 2015. And I found this slide, the system was never broken. It was ac actually built this way. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, uh, look uh, David Woods on web. Uh, there's a number of YouTube very exciting videos. One of those is this one on Emerging Issues Forum. Um, and I'll definitely look up his Adaptive Capacity Labs. Without further ado, David, the floor is yours. All right, can I share a screen now? Yes, I can. Uh, and I hit share. And play. All right, I think we've got it, right? Milos, you can see it. We're good? All right. Good. Um, today, I want to speak at a fairly strategic level. And the storyline strategically is relatively simple. Cyber is in crisis. It is stuck right, and stale relative to a changing world, changing relationships, capabilities, and obviously for what we're talking about, threats. Reframing our approach to cyber and cybersecurity, we'll talk about how I'm gonna use the word cyber, uh, requires a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift, right, focuses on the science of how adaptive systems at all and any scale work, right, and how that science base inspires and empowers resilience engineering. This is actually already developing in software engineering. It's already being a, a growing force in innovation uh, and pragmatics in software. So we're gonna talk about that, but also some of the special things that arise uh, when we think about it in, a, in today's cybersecurity context. 
So reframing cyber is a, and the first basic thing is it's a problem in resilience engineering. You can't have a better problem that illustrates why we have to focus on resilience engineering. Some of this is simply because the root is all about adaptive systems. And we'll see some aspects of that. That has a biological root. And we draw on a variety of studies from the biological world, biological systems. Uh, and of course, people are part of the biological world. From a technology point of view, the interdependencies that arise as we grow capabilities leads us to that this technically is about layered networks, right? And in particular, that they are inevitably and inherently tangled, not neat, not mappable, uh, but a bunch of extensive and hidden interdependencies. So to solve that, and driven by some of the successes in human bi and biological systems and human technology systems, we're looking at ways to build resilient control. In fact, that's when I first got involved with Milos and Idaho National Labs was in projects to advance the uh, basis so we could build resilient control systems. This is essentially human. Yes, it has technology in it, but these are stories of people and rivalry and seeking advantage and coping with complexity. Now we will, uh, cyber issues will uh, increase the attention we have to focus on how these are co-adaptive cycles. We have a basic failure mode in adaptive systems. There's only three um, and cyber as I started out is stuck, slow and stale to recognize and respond to rapidly changing relationships and threats. So when I refer to cyber, I'm referring to it in a very general way as vital digital infrastructure that supports valued services that have to operate under pressures. So this is a very specific way to think about it that's much broader than simply the security aspect. It's vital, right? The infrastructure and the services overlap or become identical as in financial uh, trading. Um, and they provide value. And so to lose that value, right, has high cost for a variety of stakeholders. They all operate under pressure. Uh, if you look at some of the origins of resilience engineering, we call that after the NASA accidents that motivated this, right, faster, better, cheaper pressure based on the history of NASA uh, and the way that they, um, uh, organizational factors set up the conditions for accidents in 1999 and the Columbia Space Shuttle accident in 2003. Now, our, our antagonist um, to adaptive systems in the cybersecurity world is Maginot thinking, and that's the Maginot line that the French constructed and the Germans bypassed, thinking that walls would protect them. And we see uh, part of being stuck in cybersecurity is the emphasis on walls, on rigidity, on constriction, on compliance, on uh, non-transparency, that people are a defect in systems. Uh, all of these kinds of things work at odds and actually undermine our ability to build continuously adaptive, poised to adapt systems. So basically, this is the story. Cyber as resilience engineering is a story of adaptive cycles that spiral over time. And those cycles illustrate risks of adaptive system breakdown and the variety of responses that go on to mitigate those or counteract those kinds of risks. Now here's item one that you need to remember. In parallel, these adaptive cycles are stories of people seeking advantage from new technological developments. There's technology in the story, but the stories are of people seeking advantage. And we could tell that in the rise of high frequency trading in, in the financial world, right? And we would see right, the investment in technology being driven by how people sought advantage to make large sums of money, often at the cost of other traders. Uh, and in parallel, 
Right? Adaptive cycles are stories of new technological capabilities producing effects far different than those managed by the developers or those who invest and, uh, and uh, decide to deploy. These are unanticipated effects of, of technology change. So resilience engineering is sine qua non for progress on cybersecurity. Right? All story, tech stories are human, are stories of extending human and amplifying human reach, right? And all human stories, because we seek advantage or compensate for difficulties and gaps that arise have technology in them. So this leads us to the second line that's going to drive today's talk. And I want you to remember. Stories of technology change describe or envision the new forms of congestion cascade and conflict that arise when apparent benefits get hijacked. A line I've been using for about five years now. All right, so the seeking of advantage by different human roles and players has led to a continuing crisis with new forms of congestion, cascade and conflict playing out in a new rivalry space that has dramatic real world consequences that we've seen vividly only uh, 15 days ago. So adaptive cycles are about people seeking advantage. I mentioned the high frequency trading case, right? That leads them to use more autonomous capabilities. Right? Much of our cyber infrastructure right, is highly autonomous and we delegate high authority to the software system. That leads to new missions, new connections, new risks, new variations, new pressures and inevitably gaps, anomalies, and surprises appear that are different from the kinds of gaps, anomalies, and surprises that we used to deal with, but ultimately reflect the same basic sources of variability and surprise in the world that we need to continuously be poised to adapt to. This is what the biological world shows us, how biological systems, ironically, one of the best test cases, viruses, uh, and how people then adapt to produce resilient performance. The pictures are in the early days of deploying small drones, a videographer trying to film a um, triathlon in Australia managed to attack accidentally one of the athletes, leaving her bloodied with a bit of the propeller in her head. Uh, she recovered uh, from that little unanticipated and new risk that arose as people sought advantage in this case of trying to film various interesting events for human audiences. As uh, Milos uh, indicated already, uh, a found sign we had uh, that illustrates some of the fundamentals, right? The system was never broken, it was built this way. Or the old line of, of systems thinking, a system does what it was designed to do, except it's not what the designer intended. And this fundamental messiness of systems is something that has to be there. In fact, the new theorems that are coming out about how adaptive systems that of all types and at any scale work says that they have to turn out to be messy, right? The tangle of interdependencies, right, ends up driving us there. Well, let's remind us of those. Think about shock events, right? We just had uh, some outages in December. We had a hack in December, right? We've had continuing ransomware uh, where events. Um, think in the financial world, the flash crashes. We had the runaway automation that bankrupted Knight Capital uh, 10 years ago. Or market outages, including recent ones. And of course, these have right, viability. These could be viability crushing events. It was certainly viability crushing when the English bank TSB had its uh, sequence of several weeks of IT meltdown that lost the chief executive his job. He thought it was pretty viability crushing. Multiple airline IT outages cost, cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, British Airways in 2016. Uh, Boeing's two 737 MAX accidents weren't just fatal, fatal accidents for 346 people. They also threatened the viability of Boeing as an organization. And surprisingly, a couple of weeks after the second accident, people started to realize it could have crushed the viability of the aviation insurance business, which provides uh, uh, lubrication for uh, the entire industry. 
And of course, the accident that started my career 40 plus years ago is the Three Mile Island nuclear accident, which led to a moribund nuclear industry over the decades. In all of these events, and many, many more we could list on slide after slide, the story is one of complexity, unappreciated brittleness and surprise, where people act as an ad hoc source of resilient performance. Uh, the pictures at the top here remind us, especially in the software world, the, right, there's an actual major software company putting up their slide on the left of the interdependencies and how messy those are, extensive and hidden. Uh, the slide with their future growth projections. If you're not growing in the software world, your company is probably failing. So, the crisis in cyber is really a specialized reflection of the general crisis of complexity in networks with extensive and hidden interdependencies, where the finding over and over again is failure is due to brittle systems. Systems is designed to more brittle than stakeholders realize, but fail less often because people, some people in various roles adapt to fill the shortfalls, right? And stretch the system performance in the space of smaller or larger surprise events which are continuous and ongoing, but often hidden because of the skill with which people adapt to take care of them. That's actually a law, a fluency law. So think about what we just ran through. There's lots of small events going, some bigger ones happening. Maybe you weren't shocked by the Google outage. I, I certainly was appreciative, right? There's a reminder to people that even lots of money and human talent is not sufficient to uh, 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 inoculate you from the problems that arise in running large-scale software systems is vital infrastructure that provides value services. Um, and the basic point here is that cyber is in a series of shock events. We have a series, it's kind of slow moving, cumulative in impact as opposed to an acute one like an aviation fatal accident. Uh, we are adapting to cope with the complexities that are being revealed by the ongoing series of shock events. Okay. And before shock events, it's easy to, dis to rationalize away that these things can really happen. And we have to build up the power to anticipate based on early emergent signals, right? And it's easy after a shock to look back and discount and uh, minimize the factors that went on right, in order to preserve our models and approaches as much as possible, rather than to engage in a process of revising, reframing, and moving forward in new directions. So shock events produce dissonance. Your model of the world doesn't match the world you're in. That's what I'm saying is going on in cyber right now. So when that you have this gap between your model of how you thought the world worked and what was good to do and what were the risks, and, you're, and the world telling you, that's not really what's going on, right? Are you going to retreat? Are you gonna to try to preserve or repair your model of how the world works? We need better walls. We need more compliance. People are, let's get more people out, right? Are you gonna revise and reframe, right? Leading to reconfiguration and renewal and expansion of your capabilities. So these questions, right, drive you, right? in response to a shock. How do you recognize your model of the world is mismatched? How do you reframe? How do you use these insights to build, sustain, and extend your adaptive capacity? So when we study adaptive systems at any scale, right, we find there are three basic ways things fail. This is from 2011, right? And everybody should know these and everyone should know to be able to talk about the countermeasures. Right. We're going to start with the one that is driving us in the cyber crisis, stuck in stale plans. It easily produces retreat that blocks updating, revision, and reframing. The talk today is to inspire you strategically to re-examine and shift strategically to a new paradigm based on adaptive systems and using the, the capabilities, the growing and emerging capabilities of resilience engineering. Right? Because you're stuck right? That leads to fragmentation across roles and levels so that different groups work across purposes. And because you're working across purposes and fragmented across the different roles, it means decompensation becomes a higher risk. 
but you can't keep pace with events. And resources of various kinds saturate expertise, attention, personnel, um, uh, and your ability to reprioritize as pressure grows. So we're stuck, fragmented, and stale. Now there's countermeasures though. That's the good news. We understand this, right? Proactive learning to revise and reframe. It's actually one of the big things that's going on in the software engineering world right now. Right? Synchronization across roles and levels can be built up through a variety of interventions such as building reciprocity across roles and what that means in the context of a socio-technical human system. And all of this supports anticipation of trouble ahead, crunches ahead. Where's their potential for saturation, right? Relative to the kinds of events, challenges, surprises, and anomalies that occur. All right, stuck, slow, and sale, stale. It's okay. It turns out the science on adaptive systems says you're going to end up there no matter what. You can't be perfect. You can't avoid this. You will get there periodically. Um, what it means is that your adaptive capacities are limited in ways relative to the environment you're currently working in. You have excess brittleness in the wrong places. Excess brittleness. Brittleness can't be zero, but you can have a lot of excess brittleness if you have a bad architecture, right? And your operating points and your ability to move those operating points is in the wrong place, right? And when you do have some, you have to have some brittleness, you can also have it parked uh, not parked in places out of the way relative to the current environment you're in, the current variability, the current challenges, but you have it in all the wrong places. So you have to confront the gap in order to start the, going down the path to expand adaptive capacity. And that starts with looking hard at that gap between the world you thought you were in and what are the signals the world is telling you that it's different. Right? But once you look into that gap, and if you are empowered with the fundamentals behind resilience engineering, it can give you insights to revise and reframe. And from that, you can start to build the adaptive capacity to steer, adjust, adapt, resync, realign, reconnect, set new courses in order to meet the challenges. So you'll be poised to adapt. All right, let's go back for a second. This theme is going to come up again. We're referring to cyber in a big picture way of vital digital infrastructure that supports valued services under pressures. Right? And the services and the infrastructure are the same or highly overlap, as I mentioned before. There are extensive and hidden interdependencies. Everybody's operating under performance pressures. We see some software companies growing in expertise, for example, in um, uh, the areas that give them um, uh, 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 strong levels of adaptive capacity. And then we've seen some of those companies under financial pressures lose that source of expertise. Um, all of the illities apply in parallel. You can't say one matters and we'll put the others off till later. No, 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 they're all in parallel, relevant, reliable, available, secure, robust, resilient. They're not the same, they interact and they all matter. And of course, the scale of modern systems, right, extends the reach impact and consequences. So the framework that we come up with is from Richard Cook, my colleague in much of this work uh, and another principal at Adaptive Capacity Labs. And you can find this in the Stella report from Snafu Catchers Right? Or you can look at ACM, it's in ACMQ as a special issue you can get. Um, the link is here. And uh, the articles also came out in ACM communications in the early uh, months of 2020. Uh, I think I have, it was 1219, not 1220 on that slide. Well, here's the drawing of above the, above the line, below the line. And the line in the middle there, right, is the line of representation. Right? That's how can you see what's below the line? And what does that mean for your work, your cognitive and collaborative work above the line? So think about this very simply. Above the line is the cognitive and collaborative work in order to understand what your system is doing, keeping track of it, recognizing anomalies, responding. 
Below the line is the stuff you build and maintain with, right? And also below the line is the product or service that is dependent on or exists only through software, distributed software services. Now, above the line, right, what matters? Why does it matter? Are you, you're observing, inferring, anticipating, collaborating, synchronizing, uh, all kinds of different things in order to make the system work, just, right? So people are critical, even though the scale at which these things operate keep growing in order to enable more valued services, right? And below the line is the stuff. Right? And of course, time matters, right? Because above the line, things are changing and below the line, things are changing. So you can see talks about this. You can read uh, descriptions of this in the uh, ACM special issue on uh, Richard's article. And you need to follow up and understand this uh, in order to frame and develop your new paradigm for emphasizing adaptive capacity in cyber. So back to these are human stories with computational drivers, right? Fiber is stuck, slow and stale as an adaptive system. The good news is advances in the laws and fundamentals that govern adaptive systems is a paradigm to guide progress towards continuous adaptability. Right? And we'll come back to that in a second on the next slide, right? But second, we have a new rivalry zone that's emerged where the connectivity and that provided value has been hijacked to serve other purposes. So we now have a co-adaptive cycle going on with rivalry and opposition. So where are you in these human stories? The fundamental cyber one that we've been looking at, for example, in the Snappy Catchers Industry University Partnership, right? And the emerging resilience engineering techniques and software engineering. Right? And in particular, as this new rivalry zone emerges. Now, these are computational stories that influence human purposes. Right? Vital digital infrastructure is inherently messy, tangled, layered network governed by these laws. And that's what turns into the continuous uh, integration, continuous deliver delivery, and the recognition that the people pushing this, John Allspaw, that we've been working with, start, was one of the people who started DevOps. Right, continuous development and deployment and started to recognize that understanding how joint human machine cognitive systems was central and resilience engineering was required. In fact, they were doing resilience engineering before they knew and understood that it existed. Uh, and uh, they were very happy to go, oh, wow, I'm doing something really smart in general. And then it was also, oops, um, right, you're doing versions of this, you need to understand the general techniques to be able to, to apply them more uh, broadly and to continue to do them effectively as conditions change. But there's a second computational story that impacts people that's going on, which is the hijacking of the valued services to empower and expand disinformation campaigns, both intentional and emergent as a challenge of the next decade. And let me say that again. Whatever you're doing, if it doesn't solve, address the challenge of disinformation campaigns, you've missed, the, you've missed what's important for the 2020s. Now, there's other crises that need to be dealt with uh, over the next decade. But for the younger people out there, disinformation right, is the challenge of the 2020s. How are we going to cope with this what's going to develop in the opposition of offense and defense as we move forward. And I want to highlight to everyone that right now, disinformation campaigns are routing all who would stand to staunch the flow. Even during a global health emergency, we are being routed in this conflict, right? This is not uh, something that we can wait on. Right? This is the challenge that is immediate right? and has real consequences for everybody right now. So let's go through this a little bit. Stories of technology change capture the new forms of congestion, cascade, and conflict that arise when the parent benefits get hijacked. Get hijacked. Seems strong. But first is, this is universal. You don't have to have an adversary for this to happen. In fact, Right? It turns out that these uh, in the extreme version are 
parasitic intrusion. Think of that biology analogy, parasites. Parasitic intrusions. Another agent comes in, another organism comes in to take advantage of some healthy activity of another species of organism. It is a unavoidable consequence in tangled layer networks. John Doyle at Caltech points out that you can't make this zero, right? But a good architecture can keep parasitic intrusions under control. So the disinformation challenge that we experience right now is an indication that the parasitic intrusions are completely out of control, right? And that means we probably have the wrong architecture. In other words, we need a strategic shift in how we approach this. So let's run through our things. Um, conflict, right? goals conflict and there's trade-offs. And that's fundamental in the science behind adaptive systems. There's always trade-offs and we've identified some fundamental ones. Ironically, it turns out to be five independently so far. Doesn't have to be, but there's some basic ones. These are not just immediate operational choices uh, about limited resources and multiple goals. Right? These are fundamental to the way this universe works. Cascade, there's an, there's an amplification of impact because of the infrastructure that we build and how it provides these valued services. Congestion, there's multiple forms of congestion. One is disinformation. There's a new rivalry space that's emerged if we focus on this as a cybersecurity issue with new front lines, new relationships, and very limited tools for countering this plague. Real world consequences are the result as we saw vividly recently on our TV screens. So let's run through these again, right? Goal conflicts lead to trade-offs in general, follow the goal conflicts. Now what is cyber at? The adversarial intent is to hobble through fragmentation. Notice that, hobble through fragmentation. That's the second way that adaptive systems break down. They are deliberately acting in ways that fragment and break up coordination, synchronization, cohesiveness, reciprocity, right? And you can see the impact of that as how it's exacerbated conditions in the response to the pandemic. So that has made performance in, for example, the US uh, very, you know, eventually we'll be able to measure it. We'll probably be pretty close to as bad as we could have been in terms of maximizing the harm from the pandemic. Um, the harm also comes from degrading the delivery of valued services. And ransomware does that, right? It was in interesting that that has been a bigger aspect of the security costs. Right? I, all I have to do is degrade your delivery of value services. And of course, you have the problem of imprecise targeting of defense efforts. So that hang, handling signals of threat and changing threat just keeps adding drag to the normal activities. Right? That's what the walls and rigidity start to do. So you end up degrading yourself just by their threat. Right? What a deal these folks have right now in attacking their adversaries. Cascade, well, to, to give these interdependencies lead to cascade effects because the scale of, of what's valuable keep going up. Those growth curves, for example, in software companies. And it requires highly autonomous systems that we delegate high authority to. So it becomes an easy amplification of disruption by, the, uh, by autonomous agents are inauthentic bots or bot networks amplify message that, messages that distract and, and fragment uh, uh, societies. It's decentralized, right? It can be an intentional campaign where some, you could hide the source. Actually, surprisingly, some of these are quite in the open. Um, and they're actually very low cost, low upfront in that capital investment. Um, and they're often emergent campaigns where human networks amplify well-placed misinformation. So cyber has added some pretty interesting uh, challenges to the cascade category. Uh, the congestion isn't just disinformation, it's the opaqueness of the systems. Remember that line of representation, right? It's hard to see what's below the line. There's limited tools, right? To cross the line between the cognitive work and understanding of is this normal? 
what's wrong? Is this an anomaly? Is this viability crushing? Is this just a problem in the system? Is this a deliberate intrusion uh, with intentional harm, the, the motive, right? Seeing the unexpected is very difficult with these high autonomy, high authority machines and the observability problem, even though there's a company that sells it, has barely been tackled. Uh, there's another funny aspect of the rivalry space. It's co-adaptive in a shared space. I mean, all the actors have access to the same tooling. Advances for some become advances for everybody. If you can see better, so can they. If you can act differently to influence things, so can somebody else probably. Uh, and so this shared activity space in which things play out, bring a unique twist to it in the cyber world. Obviously, we're focusing on the disinformation campaigns, right? And defense requires strong and different forms of coordination and synchronization. So we need to shift our paradigm in order to build those forms of coordination and synchronization, right? So we can anticipate and act in a timely way to keep pace with the challenge new front lines, new partners. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, oh, right now, what's the next slide? Well, this is going on, right? This has been going on. So we have organizations that are the new front lines or the new key players. They aren't necessarily or even regularly the normal security organization that are hidden off behind their firewalls of blocking information. The companies have their own firewalls and their own reasons to maintain those and what to release. Um, and they talk about, for example, how do we detect and block coordinated or large scale inauthentic activity, nice euphemism, inauthentic activity, right? As engagement from bot accounts and coordinated manual accounts. You can imagine who you're thinking about, talking about. So mostly we don't know what goes on in this. And occasionally we get a glimpse. And recently in the last year, uh, a variety of information came out that gives us some glimpse of things. And it turns out it plays pretty nicely with the findings in, on adaptive systems and resilience engineering, right? Rec there's a recognition challenge, right? You need skill to discover the fake account networks. As a person put it, uh, someone informed the organization that there was a actor with perhaps a national group uh, doing inauthentic activity on a high profile victim uh, and we missed it. Right? So that the site integrity, their label uh, within the or defense organization uh, removed the activity dousing the immediate site. So an individual with responsibility for maintaining integrity was able to take action. Um, second challenge is how do you keep pace with the scale? Um, if you look at what they're doing, they can say they're being successful. Um, and I think the first example here is particularly relevant in the pandemic. I becoming, became aware of coordinated manipulation on uh, a health, uh, national health page during a, a pandemic. And so an individual, right, was key to finding and removing hundreds of thousands of fake accounts that were also acting more globally than this one nation. Right? That people would interfere with a coherent and coordinated response in a worldwide pandemic indicates the level of which this challenge matters. How do we keep pace with the scale? Uh, delay. The organizations uh, who are the front lines now, right, may not react quickly when you do recognize what's going on. And the other side of this is the opponents actually have a great deal of mechanisms by which to avoid and work around any blockages that are put up. Okay. Uh, so it took nine months in one case uh, to act on a coordinated campaign. Two weeks after or, uh, the block occurred, the perpetrators were back, right? Working just as effectively as before, uh, which someone referred to as they're playing whack-a-mole between the uh, defense and the offense. 
right? And uh, as of the time we got this insight into what was going on, and we uh, believe the activity is still uh, is still going on unstopped. Um, so this stuff could go on depending on your the third one on the side prioritization. Um, authority. Who has the authority to block things? Who has the authority to turn things off? Well, obviously that is much in the news, uh, but uh, in this case, the reports we had from an insider was that there's a lot of so much violating behavior, they had to delegate down tremendous amounts of authority to individual personnel about whether to further investigate, file it away, escalate the prioritization, or even to demand prioritization when they saw something, how to get the organization to commit to a new course of action, to take action, and to do it in a timely way when that organization has many other priorities and purposes. And in fact, never was supposed to be a frontline defense organization running a national critical service. Um, so we can see where, oh, this happened in two other nations, but that wasn't that important to this organization and workload constraints meant they, meant they had to make priority decisions. Um, often the, um, uh, uh, it turned out what's going to drive their prioritization. The local perspective of that organization of what causes them the most harm, right? Or the ones that cause the most uh, uh, harm to elections or to populations. How do they prioritize? They have built specialized team to spot bad actors abusing systems. Not, they're not, not trying, but look at the scale, look at the prioritization, look at the authority problems, look at the pressures they have to deal with. As one person recounted that, um, that received the comment, the outside world was effectively the Wild West and you're a part-time dictator, right? But that was taken as immense pressure, right? But there's also pressures on the organizations at the top level, as you can read about in the news. Slow commitment to a course of action, right? The best way to gain attention, the, the person recognizing it as a site integrity person, right, went through proper reporting channels, but to post about the issues uh, instead on other mechanisms like internal message boards to try to build pressure in the organization to generate faster response. Obviously, we move away from being early and proactive to, to uh, eliminate and put out fires before they get big. Um, in one case, it was waiting before, uh, and it took it when it became a PR fire before it became high priority to the organization. Um, the, um, there's a variety of fa factors that influence when the organization will respond, and you often see it slow. So by the time they are able to understand and commit and turn it off, it's already become something big that's had significant harm and can live on despite the intervention that was put forward. Um, and I love the weak coordination of counteractions, even within a single organization, much less across organizations, right? That it was often how we were uh, combating inauthentic activity was often haphazard and slapdash. So this is a real report. Now, I am not claiming this is completely veridical. And if we examine carefully, these would all be the same conclusions. I'm pointing out all of this matches what we understand about how adaptive systems break down, how adaptive systems become maladaptive, slow and stale, fragmented, you know, locally adaptive, but globally maladaptive to the scale and type of problems they're facing. They're unable to keep pace with events, right? And get overwhelmed so that more harm gets through. So where are we? Back at the beginning, we need to build adaptive capacities. We need to build up the ability to be poised to adapt. And that's a readiness to revise, a readiness to respond, right? The potential to change how a system currently works, its models, plans, processes, behaviors, relationships, partnerships, right? To continue to fit changing situations, changing anomalies, changing threats, changing surprises. Right? It's a pre preparatory investment is required to provide the potential for future adaptive action. By the way, viruses do this. 
Biology does this. I even just discovered for my new talk next month, plants do this, right? We have lots of documentation about how the world works, right? From an adaptive perspective and how it malfunctions from an adaptive perspective. Now we can, you probably might have noticed I haven't defined resilience. Doesn't every talk have to start with the definition of resilience? Oh, oh, notice I don't do that because we've written about it and the point of the definition has gotten lost. It's a lot of noise, but you can look at the 2015 paper. You can find my stuff at ResearchGate, um, which lays out four different ways it's used. Sharky et al. in the 50th anniversary network special issues put out a great piece examining network science from the point of view of the different ways that we use the word resilience and the technical meanings behind those different uh, families of usage. And you can see the fundamentals play out, right? Uh, because we have better and better understanding. We have stronger theories. We have theorems that have been proved. We have to be proven, but provable theorems that are at work here. So we have a hard science base for how this works. I'm not gonna try to explain that today as we're about out of time. Um, uh, but these are all available, right? And this is a strategic realignment that I'm putting forward to. So what have we done? What have we covered? The shift to resilience engineering is already underway in software engineering. There's work going on that builds the tools and processes for continuing adaptability. The build is being poised to adapt. It all applies to cyber as a security challenge. Um, and simply adding uh, a new phrase to a common acronym, it's now DevSecOps, right, is insufficient, right? We have to really engage, right? And that engagement is a paradigm shift for science-based resilience engineering. The science space is hard, it's different. It requires integrating information from a wide variety of backgrounds. It's desperately needed in the avalanche of intentional and emergent disinformation campaigns, right? And this challenge requires a a generation of new capabilities and a complete realignment of the coordinating systems across many different organizational boundaries. In many ways, it represents a, a repeat of something that's happened often in military history, where offense or defense, one side gets the advantage uh, over the other relative to changes in organization tactics and technology. Right, and then the other side, or right now, the offense in terms of attacks has gained the upper hand. And we need to build up over the next decade, or, short, or shorter, uh, a new kind of defense, a new kinds of interventions and countermeasures against this shift uh, in the balance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. I, I wish we were doing this in person. I know how um, much fun it can be when, when it's done in person, but we do what we can via Zoom. So, I thought I share, I thought I did. Uh, oh, did, okay, good. I did stop sharing. Excellent. Alrighty, so we got a, a few questions through, uh, through a chat window here. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go through them uh, one by one and uh, attendees feel free to, to type in your questions and we'll try to address them all. Uh, Mario at the beginning asked, um, I'll read his questions. In terms of applying resilience engineering and safety science lessons from the last 20 years, do you believe that the adversarial nature of cyber, cyber invalidates or in any way affects applicability of those approaches? So um, the basic answer I tried to give in the talk is you have to do, if you can't do the basic stuff, you're not gonna tackle the special adversarial uh, atoms. The basic stuff is there. And that's what we've been showing in, uh, in our partnership with software engineering companies. Um, that all of these things, uh, it's easier to study when the surprises and anomalies arise from processes of growth and new relationships uh, and a, a bunch of other messinesses that are built in to a growing, changing, highly automated software world, software infrastructure. Uh, but if you can't tackle those, you're not gonna be effective at tackling the special, the special additions on cyber. Remember the example I gave was parasitic intrusions. The hijacking, right, 
when I when I wrote that line about five years ago, I wasn't talking about cyber. I wasn't thinking of cyber at security at all, right? However, right, the hijacking that goes on, like for example, in, in uh, the rise of high frequency trading, can get pushed all the way out to this kind of adversarial where the intent is to harm, right? The intent is to break down. And what's interesting, the most effective breakdowns to date have been the ones that, imp that block your ability to access valued services. And the mechanisms they use to do that are the valued services themselves or what the infrastructure that creates those. You read the Snafu Catcher's Stella report, you'll see this, these are strange loops. And one of the real difficulties throughout all of this, and it happens in almost all of the regular anomalies, non-security anomaly incident cases we've looked at, strange loops pop up where, right, a service that's affected, you, you need a service that's affected by the outage or the outage affects a service that's required to solve the outage or the risk of outage. So this shared activity space, these shared tool sets, all right, produce some really interesting effects, but they're there now. And they're there with some extra oomph when it's cybersecurity. Thank you, Dave. So I'll, I'll switch. Uh, the, uh, the attendees are posting questions in both Q&A and chat. So uh, please put your questions in, in Q&A so we don't miss them. I'll address one of those that came through the chat window. Um, he's, uh, the, 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 the attendees uh, asking, um, uh, are you referring to the notion of guardrails essentially becoming handcuffs? <laughs> Um, so remember in adaptive capacity, right? It's about being prepared to change. Are you ready to revise? Are you ready to respond, right? And so kind of guardrail makes sense in one environment and context, yes, right? But the issue is, do you understand its limits and boundary conditions? And so that you can recognize and respond Often what we see are people put in these kinds of, whether it's a guardrail or some other kind of a deliberate limit. Another one is to say unrecognized limits of things. That's what I usually deal with. And then you find that the evidence, the world is telling you, hey, right? That's not, you know, your boundary is smaller than your competence is less than you thought. And there's more and more severe challenges at the limits of your boundaries. Um, you need to learn and change. And what happens, we've written about this forever, is discounting. They discount the evidence, they retreat, and right, and they repair their existing model. And of course, what's the easiest way to do that is to say people are unreliable. But there's other ways to do that. And that's called the co component substitution fallacy, where you substitute a, uh, any event that happens will identify a weakness. Has to, because we make trade-offs, we have limited resources. Right? We can't build everything to perfect quality that we would, might like. And so uh, in that process, any event that happens will reveal component or subsystem weaknesses. But that's not the, yes, you should fix components or subsystems that are implicated. Reducing weaknesses is great, but there's still weaknesses in the system. Right? What you have to do is look at the emergent system properties that are revealed by this. We just went through this with NASA over how NASA has learned from the Columbia accident and is using that in order to help, even though they still get surprised and they still get trapped because of the trade-offs and performance pressures they have to operate under. Thank you very much. I'll uh, combine several questions into one here. Uh, one is, what are the implications of artificial intelligence and machine learning, particularly systems that require lots of data to learn? And uh, here's another one that might be connected to that. Do you, envision, do you envision learning system, system that adapts through machine learning perhaps as part of solution? And if so, would the use of these automated learning systems and to the complexity entanglement and even introduce more cyber vulnerabilities that way? And here's another one that extends to, 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 to human factors. How does human and cyber converge? So AI, human, cyber. Um. So, um, so right before uh, we started talking today, I got a uh, message from a former student 
about uh, an AI guided camera for soccer, for football games. And of course, what happened is it somehow got locked onto the bald referee's head and no one was able to watch the soccer game because it just kept following the referee and never showed where the ball was. Um, uh, right, I mean, my talk about um, modern statistical AI and give, given for a while, you can see it on the internet. Um, uh, uh, some of my things have the link. Um, highlights that uh, machine learning is not ready for this. Uh, it may work through people in terms of analytic tool to gain insights, which then gets translated through other engineering and system design mechanisms, but directly coupling it to the world. And we have so many examples. And I just put up one after another after another of avatars that become neo-Nazi racists in less than 24 hours. Uh, you know, from you know, Microsoft tried one and had to pull it down with less than a day. I mean, we go uh, example after example after example that these things have unintended consequences in the world. Um, so the, um, the issue is the reverse, right? Is in order to get the value, the human story of getting value requires investment in technology, right? That technology is a, the value comes from the information we get and the, uh, um, and the connectivity it provides. Right? Notice this information is heavily dependent on connectivity and how people share information. So um, uh, then you can use this um, uh, to, in order to take advantage of this, you have to have highly autonomous systems. You have to delegate some authority to them. How do you manage that authority? How do you, how do you understand whether the aut autonomous system is doing what it's supposed to be doing, whether it's being influenced to doing something that isn't cognizant isn't what it's supposed to be doing, how it's misbehaving for other reasons, bad inputs in the Boeing automation accidents gives it bad inputs of the control system doing the wrong thing or doing the right thing for its model of the world when it's in a very different world. These kinds of fail active. Uh, the runaway automation in the Knight Capital case, half a billion dollars bankrupt company is an example of this. And I can give you examples all the way back to 1950, we were warned about this by Norbert Wink. So um, the idea that um, putting our eggs on, an, uh, on autonomy is going to solve this is, is wrong. Uh, it's technically wrong because what you'll end up doing is violating many of the things I sketched for you. And we just sketched them at the top level. All of these require digging in a variety of places to understand them. Uh, they're not necessarily, and what's the fundamental finding? Since we started, we did this back in 86. Machines are brittle, period. Machines are brittle, absolutely period. We keep rationalizing in a way that only that last technology was brittle, the next one isn't. Because we can show it's an improvement it has a performance improvement. And we go, no, 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 they're brittle. At the edges, the limits, they have limits. They're not where you think they are. There's more, more challenges happening than you recognize, right? And in biology, it doesn't work that way. Brittle systems will fail in the long run. That will kill the organism or the species. No biological system exists for long if it works the way the way we design our machines, intelligent or not. The missing ingredient is called graceful extensibility. The discovery of graceful extensibility, see the 2015 paper, the easy talk is the 2019 chapter, right? The theory is 2018. Get them all on ResearchGate, right? The discovery of graceful extensibility changes this. Viability requires extensibility. That is a hard constraint on the biological adaptive universe. You can't escape that. So what happens? We keep building machines that violate that. They're not really an adaptive system. And who steps into the breach? Some people, some of the time, step in to add the graceful extensibility that is a necessary component for viability of all existing systems at all scales. That's why we keep seeing this finding that people are the ad hoc source of resilient performance, while the uh, rationalizers and discounters keep going, well, oh, people did something odd. People are terrible. Let's automate more. Oh, no. That opposition is missing the synthesis that adaptive systems bring, right? And how 
what leads to more maladaptive, what leads to better adaptation or fitness. And that, that search for being well adapted is a question. It's a project. It's never an answer because the world keeps changing because resources are finite. These are not optional aspects of our world. And our rationalizations to say that doesn't really apply to me are just that. And our advances as in uh, critical digital services, powering everything, especially as we're all locked down at home, right, highlights that you can't hide in, in some isolated linear world standing apart from the inherent complexities. That's a quick overview of a bunch of this different stuff. But you know, this is not a human and then add some cyber, or this, this is, you know, AI applications will continue to grow. What's the line I use, right? If you have a clear cut mission, right? To and you're trying to design an integrated system that will serve that mission. You will make use of some autonomous capabilities and you'll have to delegate it some authority. However, if, you're, if your goal is to maximize the use of autonomous capabilities, you'll never build an integrated system that's effective at accomplishing key missions. That's just plain true. And we keep trying to work around this stuff and rationalize. And that's why this commitment to an adapt the science behind resilience engineering about how adaptive systems work. It doesn't fit a lot of our preconceived notions about how the world should work because those tend to be driven by linearization. And the fact that we made a bunch of successes through linearizing, linearizing the world uh, that got us a lot of efficiency and productivity and dumped all the extra work to maintain viability on a variety of people with punctuated by brittle collapses. That's what I put up at the beginning is a whole series. And, I could have gone page after page, story after story of these as forms of brittle collapse. Thank you very much. I, I have a few questions on my own, but I will favor uh, uh, the attendees one and, 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 and leave mine for, for later to you directly. Uh, this one is, is thought provoking uh, relative to disinformation. So Peter is saying when dealing with combating disinformation, what do we do to combat the abuse of such technologies and processes being used to suppress legitimate information that is unwanted? Question mark, transparency, question mark. Uh, you, uh, I, 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 um, you don't have to answer. <laughs> I'm going to not give the, uh, uh, the, uh, the politician's non-answer, right? Which is, that's why I said for all the young people out there, this is the challenge of the 2020s. If you, if we've got to figure out a way to do this, right? And the adaptive world says there's trade-offs, right? And because this is a shared activity space, because of the strange loop properties of this means that what we use for defense can become offense in another way. What we use to block some things will end up uh, 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 legitimately, uh, given the kind of harm that can be created, will end up short-circuiting something else that that reasonable perspective see as valuable. Um, the interconnectedness and interdependencies make this, but this is why you can't hide from it. If you do the simple simplifications, you, you're refusing to engage. It's like saying the war is over there and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, you know, it's more comfortable to go over on this nice grassy knoll. It's pretty and the sun is shining. I'm gonna fight over here. The war's over there for God's sake. And we're losing badly, right? This isn't close, right? If this was a kinetic war, right? The opponents would have shattered our lines. We'd all be running in terror and getting hunted down by their cavalry. We are losing. And it's time we take a, uh, we have to work in different ways. That's why I ran through. Think of who the new front lines are. Why are a few people on a non-productive part of a, of a social media company the front lines? They are the new front lines in national security. This is crazy. Uh, oh, wait a minute. The disinformation campaigns are internal, not from ta targeted from outside. Oh, wait a minute. Because people seek advantage by fragmenting and disempowering others through noise and confusion. Oh, these are forms of conflict that have gone on forever or tools in conflict that have gone on forever that have now been translated into this new kind of virtual rivalry space. 
And I don't like to use war things because it's a new kind of rivalry space. You have to think about in new terms with some connection and, and, um, and metaphors from kinetic type activities. It's embedded in our pursuit of value. That's why it's parasitic intrusions, right? That's why it's a great name for it. These are parasitic intrusions. We, if we take that biological starting point, maybe we can invent and have insight into some mechanisms by understanding how biology is able to minimize or channel parasitic intrusions. Right? Uh, and I'm told that even mosquitoes have some value purpose in the ecosystem. I'm not sure I believe it yet, but I'm told that. Well, interesting thought for, for sure. Uh, we, we, we tend to ignore these things um, and, and we are paying the price for it. Um, the question from Ron Boring, who, who our friend, who will be speaking uh, in, in a few months as well. He says, uh, so we'll, we'll stay at this information, but we'll go back to cyber a little bit more. Ron is saying, love the connections to misinformation, David, thought provoking as always. We typically think of cyber as hacking a computer system. Here you've expanded the definition to hacking, congestion things outside computer systems, disrupting needed services. Are the implications of misinformation to more traditional cyber domains as well? For example, the goal of cyber intrusions is not always disrupting necessarily, sometimes to gain access as well. Does information lead to gaining access as well? So uh, what I wanna uh, anticipate a comment like this. Uh, thank you, Ron. And um, what I wanna say is, is that um, uh, the adaptive perspective in resilience engineering is another level on understanding cyber, the cyber world in general and the security aspects in particular. Um, that doesn't mean the other things are, are invalid or unimportant. It just means they're not enough. Uh, so is managing intrusions valuable? Sure. I mean, it's like saying, should you have good guard duty? You know, yes, I have a force in the field. To, uh, because you're talking about the strategic way to win, you know, what's going on in the campaign and what do we need to do to think strategically? We should stop putting guards on duty to protect our depots and supplies and whatever. Of course not. Um, right? You, these are all parts of the enterprise. Um, uh, can people do espionage through cyber means? Of course. Should we have counter espionage? Of course. Right? Um, is that a great example of co-adaptive? Has that got some uh, of these strange loop, it has a strange loop quality of who's a double, triple, uh, all our movie cliches, right? Um, the, um, uh, uh, so the, the, the strategic realignment, rethinking and reframing I'm trying to talk about is to say, how do we put this all together? And the reason I ran through those examples from one insider who found a way to talk about their experience uh, was to highlight how different this is, where harm is clear, right? And the kind of harm has this funny quality of creating noise and confusion and incoherence, fragmentation, right? That there's new front lines, there's new actors on those front lines, there's new organizations who are critical. There's new divides between the different officially tasked organizations and the ones who are actually doing the work, or at least a, a significant aspect, a significant player in the work, right? It's almost as if we empowered and trained a group to do things if our, in our kinetic analogy and sent them off. And then we found out that the actual work, problem we're fighting has a bunch of other auxiliaries who turn out to be more important than the ones we trained to do stuff. So. Right? and equipped to do stuff. And it turns out these other people with different equipment and different roles are the ones who are doing all the damn fighting and they're about to lose. We need some help over here, please. Um, so this is an impassioned appeal to the younger people here. Right? One of the benefits of me getting old is uh, by the time you've solved this or not, I, I probably won't know whether you did or you didn't. So that's one of the signs of future Alzheimer's, right? Uh, so really, it's your, your world. Uh, and the good news is we've got a base to work from. We're understanding this stuff better and better. Uh, now, yes, there's noise. And yes, there's, some, there's lots of trails we're following. Some will turn out to be important. Some will turn out to be unproductive or false trails. Yes, there's a lot of diversity. Um, yes, there's a lot of noise. Uh, but 
there's a bigger and bigger signal coming out about how adaptive systems work, how you can use that pragmatically. And it's fun because right, a lot of our old cliches of linearization don't work. So it's really interesting to work on this. And it's really important to work on this. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, I'd like to combine again, a couple of questions um, with uh, one of my questions relative to uh, in practice, how do you build adaptive capacity in cyber world? And I will support that with a couple of questions from, from the audience. Arun is saying, how do we make adaptive systems? What should we do uh, relative collective cohesiveness, higher communication? Um, Jennifer is saying most roles associated with human side of cybersecurity re require many computer science certifications and degrees. If we narrowly ta tailor those who get a seat at the table, aren't we limiting the ability to develop creative adaptive solutions? So I'm wondering if you can uh, co Let's take the last one uh, first, which is these are these are all post disciplinary problems where people need to have uh, an understanding uh, and your teams have to have complementary skills that are open, you know, in this larger, greater synthesis. Um, it, you know, um, uh, for example, in building collaborations, one of the key things is building reciprocity. Where does reciprocity come from? It comes from social science. Got the Nobel Prize for um, Eleanor Ostrom in 2009, who was able to document how uh, properties like reciprocity in human systems overcame the tragedy of the commons. So the math was wrong. People, human systems don't get trapped in prisoner's dilemmas and the tragedy of the commons as much as the math says. Um, she gets the Nobel Prize, an empiricist, social scientist in economics, first time, and a woman, first time. Um, so radical on many fronts. Well, how do you translate that? Well, the problem in the standard put every discipline at the table is the social scientists and the engineers can't talk to each other, right? The social scientists say to the engineers, you're ignoring our key findings. And the engineers say, well, what am I supposed to do with it? You, you know, tell me, tell me what, what actions I can take. And social scientists say, I don't know, I'm not an engineer. And the engineers go, well, what good are you? You can't tell me what I should do differently, right? And so how do you create a new synthesis? Well, guess what? Turns out, if you look at nonlinear control and how this works in layered networks, it turns out you can define reciprocity in an actionable way. Oh, in fact, even better, it turns out to be a requirement if you're going to meet the constraint of viability requires extensibility. It turns out no single unit can provide enough extensibility to ensure viability why? Because finite resources and the pressure to be efficient in the short run. So what does that mean? It means to meet the constraint, a, a, any given unit won't have enough graceful extensibility and needs help from others to extend their ability to extend gracefully at the edges. Except right? so that means you need reciprocity as a fundamental characteristic and we can define it and implement it and we even implemented it in a single, in a simple human automation pilot, autopilot example, where real accidents and real serious incidents have happened in aviation. And it gives us a different way to use conventional mathematics and control uh, mechanisms in order to have a system that perform gives you resilient control. So we can do resilient control. You know why? What? Mostly we don't try. Because we keep over-relying. The automation will do it. The next algorithm will do it. That, oh, oh, it'll learn the right answer now. Or we don't care. We just leave it to someone else. We don't talk to each other necessarily. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's part of all this. The, um, the, first, quest, the first part of it was a little different uh, access uh, of, about how do we work, uh, I think a little bit about how do we build adaptive capacity and how do we work on it. And, and uh, the, the thing is, look at the Adaptive Capacity Labs uh, site. You'll see a bunch of activities that are going on with actual working organizations to do this. Um, if, you, uh, if you look at some of the mechanisms and some of the best companies at, at uh, producing robust and resilient uh, digital infrastructure, ironically, Netflix is one. Uh, 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 I, I know there's groups at Microsoft who are on, on the line today and they're trying very hard too. Uh, and they also admire what Netflix does. Um, and uh, uh, you can look at some of the ways that they're investing in this. It does take resources, you, you know, and we've seen uh, organizations that were very good at this and growing in this capability 
who got uh, slammed by financial pressures, which led to a, a loss of an exodus of expertise and the projects and developments of these skills. So we've seen it go both ways uh, in all of this. But uh, many of these are, are very pragmatic processes. Um, and uh, some of them are actually in the software. So there's a new startup uh, called Jelly uh, that's developing some of the tooling below the line, right? And how that tooling can work in order to prepare you to adapt. Uh, we're working on some demonstrations right now. John and uh, Richard are working on some demonstrations uh, that show you how you could design your software for the fact that who and how, who you're interacting with, the, the part of the software's distributed system you're responsible for, right? Uh, given a variety of kinds of uncertainties and surprises that you can guarantee are likely to happen. So I don't know the details of it, but I know the shape of surprise. And how do you get prepared to be flexible and adaptive when these things arise? And guess what? You can, that actually determines how you not only you set up your software and how you set up the information that flows so you can quickly learn and adapt. So these things are happening right now. And we could give you more talks on those. And some of them are online. And, and uh, some of those are consulting projects. And some of those are research projects, depending on who you are and how you want to contribute to this strategic response to a crisis. Thank you very much. So we went uh, a little bit longer, but these are really good questions, good answers. Um, uh, how would you like to end this talk? Um, I'd like you to give us uh, a few more links where to look for more for your work. Um, I enjoyed watching your YouTube videos. Um, one of those at NC State where you started referring to TMI mm -hmm. and that's, that's what I introduced me to human factors to begin with. I know it's, it's part of your early career. Uh, give us some, some more pointers where to go and, and follow your work, please. The, the one resource is look at the research gate page and there's a variety of kinds of things. Um, some future talk uh, I expect to do a, in the next month or so, we'll uh, be trying to do a uh, major synth synthesis on bet hedging. Remember, viruses bet hedge, plants bet hedge, people bet hedge. And I'm trying to integrate all of the techniques across these different parts of biology and human systems into the fundamentals of how you have to hedge your bets in an uncertain changing world. And that there's regularities on how all adaptive systems do this. There are different ways adaptive systems do this and which ones are workable uh, in the long run uh, and which ones aren't. Uh, so that's something coming. Uh, the Re uh, Resilience Engineering Association uh, virtual meeting will be in late June. We're doing a campaign of events. We've already started. Um, we'll be in increasing the tempo of events uh, through the spring leading to a kind of crescendo of activities uh, online activities in uh, late June, third week in June. Uh, so that's our way to adapt to the, take advantage of the opportunity that the pandemic uh, uh, lockdowns have created for us, which is a great example of an adaptive system. It's not copy of physical meeting onto a virtual platform, but say, what, what does it relax? What constraints does it relax that inhibited our ability to achieve the goals of uh, what we used to do in live meetings and expand it. Um, the Adaptive Capacity Lab website has links to a variety of talks that explain it above the line, below the line. Uh, you can see the ACMQ special issue or in uh, December, 2019. And then the, um, all those articles are reprinted in uh, communications in the first few months of 2020. Um, you can see Richard Cook's Bone is Resilience talk. Um, I would recommend, and I know um, Dave Alderson put up the link to his paper with Sharkey on uh, the networks review, which I think is a very useful one to go through. Um, you can look at Dave Alderson's, some of Dave Alderson's work in particular. He has a, he and I have a, have a kind of complimentary talks on complexity. If you look up uh, Carter Rock, Naval Center Carter Rock complexity, you'll get links to their series on complexity. And if you watch Dave Alderson on organized complexity, and then my follow-up, uh, which covers some adaptive cycles and some basics in uh, the science behind resilience engineering and how that contributes to the engineering possibilities. Um, we have a new talk on um, autonomy, uh, which is not out yet. We're still doing post-production on it, uh, but we'll hope to get that out. 
and uh, you know, follow me on Twitter to get notices on some of these things, DD Woods too, and try to put out some pointers and references to some of these things when they're happening. Um, uh, Dave Alderson's work I mentioned. Um, there's some other interesting, uh, uh, we can just go on and on and on. The REA uh, meeting in June should be a good place to see some things and to contribute some things that other people here are doing as I look at some of the people who signed in and joined us for our fun, fun today. There's still 68 of you hanging in there, my goodness. That's right. Well, uh, Vicki Vicky Beer asks, hi Vicki, if you're still there, you asked about the, um, and some of these uh, uh, rapidly evolving problems that we just, can we do, is the only response to slow the world down? Uh, and, uh, and I think the answer is our ability to do that is very limited. Uh, and instead we say, what is the investment? What's the preparatory investment to build um, anticipation uh, and uh, how does that work? Uh, so how do you, you speed responses by the preparatory investments? And that's what we often find get cut. Uh, and that makes the difference between the journeyman and the expert. Um, uh, and you degrade that ex source of expertise, you're degrading your extensibility, your graceful extensibility, your increasing brittleness. So a lot of this is about scoring the way uh, that, that investments are made or, or resources are extracted for efficiency goals that end up undermining the sources of resilient for resilient performance. Um, and uh, being able to match and vary tempo. By the way, the ability to match and vary tempo isn't in any AI system. And I've worked on AI system for 40 years in the interaction and I keep going, you know, in real systems, if you can't match and vary tempo of operations, you can't do the job. And nobody in AI deals with that. Nobody, not at all, not, because they can't, right? The way they put the algorithms together can't deal with tempo. So that's just one of the kinds of fundamental limits on, on how it needs to be a partnership. Remember, we started back in actually 1982 saying it's a joint system of people and machines. It's not about one or the other. It's all about what emerges at the intersections as they take on difficult demands. And that's still very true today. So great challenges for everybody. I am happy to help. And I am, um, and I am optimistic that you will come up with some good stuff. David, with every question you, with every answer, you open another question. So <laughs> we are just getting more and more people interested in in following up with you, um, and and I'm sure uh, great things will come out of that. I'm I'm personally now curious about uh, is AI helping humans? Humans helping AI, uh, or um, where's the whole thing? Uh, of shared autonomy and everything going, um, but we could go on and on and on on these topics. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one more um, uh, uh, opportunity to, to, to end this uh, beautiful uh, presentation. So go ahead and then I will announce next uh, month the presenter. Well, I hope everyone has, uh, I, I would like to say that this is hopefully a stimulating curiosity. So don't try to get a quick answer. Don't try to oversimplify. Dig in. Uh, <laughs> question, be skeptical, but dig in. It comes from a variety of sources. Um, it, it requires uh, being able to stretch out into some different disciplines on how they look at the world. But in the end, all the interesting stuff is what emerges from those different lines of inquiry. And so if you're curious and open and willing to combine things in new ways. It's the best way to have insights. It's the best way to have interesting research-oriented careers. And it generates real pragmatic action uh, for problems that often look intractable that we struggle with, or we make progress on one side to only have offsetting penalties on the other side. Uh, so it's a, it's a great way to work. And this is the challenge here, but it's also fun. Uh, to tackle these things as well as uh, uh, result pr provides results. Um, it's a constant surprise as we as we try to understand these interesting phenomena of the adaptive universe, and it isn't. It really, really is not what we thought it was, <laughs> and that's what science is supposed to be about. So, what what could be better? And I hope I've engaged some of you in pursuing and investing some of your energy in this stuff. 
great way, way to end this lecture. Uh, I like the stimulating curiosity. You definitely stimulated our curiosity and uh, we are in for many more surprises. Uh, so we will stay, stay in touch with you. Thank you very much one more time. The next presenter, um, Lori Kaner, uh, will be speaking to us on the um, uh, 18th of February. Uh, Lori is coming from Carnegie Mellon and holds a number of um, positions relative to uh, cybersecurity and privacy uh, and human side of, of cybersecurity and privacy. So mark your calendars for the February 18th. Thank you very much for joining us today and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.